The following presentation was recorded at the 2013 Southeast Linux Fest in Charlotte, North Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information about the Southeast Linux Fest, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following diamond sponsors in 2013 for helping make these videos possible. All right, so it's 9 o'clock. Let's get started. <laughs> Thanks for coming to Southeast Linux Fest. My name is Lincoln Baxter, and this is my talk on URL rewriting as a concept and how we can use that as applied to developer productivity, usability, and security. And this is actually something I really like to do. I started working on URL rewriting tools around 2008, I guess, when I was trying to found a small startup company called OCPsoft, which is where I still do some of my work. If you'd like to follow me on Twitter, my handle is Lincoln3, and I say a lot of really weird stuff and occasionally something useful. So first of all, what is URL rewriting? Can any of you people, you people, tell me? Excellent. Very good answer. This is a readable, readable room location. <laughs> oh, slide's already up. Let's fix that. So yeah, so uh, for those who may not have followed a somewhat cryptic response to my question, URL rewriting is the manipulation of the address, typically to take a complicated, ugly, unreadable thing and turn it into something readable or solve a bunch of other problems that we'll talk about today. But as a general concept, I like to say that it is pretty much any manipulation of the HTTP request and re response lifecycle. So the URL, the headers, uh, you know, potentially cookies or anything else that you want to change going inbound and outbound. So judgments prevent us from seeing the good that lies beyond appearances. What does this mean? Well, when you go to a website, and the first reaction that you have is, ugh. That's a judgment that could potentially prevent you from really engaging with or utilizing a potentially functional website. And we're very good at this. It doesn't take us very long at all to figure out that something is, looks like crap or feels like crap or is potentially secured like crap. So <laughs> we tend to leave immediately. And that is what I would call a failed user interaction. I would argue that the user interaction doesn't start when you get to the website. It starts when you get to the link to the website. And that's one of the things we'll talk about today. So we've got problems with the web. The first one is uh, missing resources or relocated resources. So the web is full of these holes that were once filled with content or where we thought content was supposed to be, but it's just not there anymore. And this is actually a really big problem. Uh, the second problem is readability and clutter. There is a lot of junk out on the internet. And this leads us to potential security problems, to potential social engineering problems. And it's something we can help address when we develop our own applications. Then the corresponding topic to that would be formatting that information so that it can actually be readable and more secure. Also. The URL is a place where we can reveal a lot of potentially sensitive information about the application we're developing. And also, um, you know, the, the, the request response headers and all that, that stuff is also visible and, and, and needs to be secured. And that gets us to the last point of validation. So how do we close these gaps? And URL rewriting can help us do that using a few very simple techniques. So there are a lot more problems than this out on the internet. But We'll talk about those five and maybe a few more. So if there's one thing that I'd like to get across during this talk is that URL re rewriting is not a good choice for doing it wrong. <laughs> so let's get started. Missing resources. Who saw this coming? <laughs> Everyone. Good. You're with me. So, this is actually such a big problem that 
it can cause massive community responses in times of great change or great catastrophe. And this happens Oracle when they purchased Sun, which if you're in the Java community, you were oh so thrilled about, but it's turned out to be okay. But this was the general response to this whole problem. Oracle broke all the links to Sun documentation and everyone was broken for about a month. Oh well. That's what I say about that. So we start seeing like more creative and interesting <laughs> responses to this situation. You know, people start throwing up little cutesy kittens. Blizzard actually blames you for finding a problem with their website. And then people get a little crazy. And I really, I don't know what that thing is. <laughs> this is one of my personal favorites. And this is mine, if I can get my remote to work. And then people start investing actual time and money in these things. They start you know, hiring a design team and making little cute videos. And we're all probably familiar with the Octokitty and his little, this is not the page you're looking for, reference to Star Wars. And then people go a little over the top. <laughs> All of that for a 404 page. Is that accessible to people with disabilities? Is that a fair 404 page? <laughs> I would say that it is more accessible than a traditional 404 page because it is both auditory and visual as opposed to simply visual. Was there text? There is text okay. on the page as well. I just took a little snippet of the video. But good question. So then we get people who are taking drugs to start making their 404 videos. Anyway, I digress. So what does it mean? What it means is it's really a distraction from failure. This is uh, something that is not a positive experience. And there are two ways to have this experience. The page existed and now does not, which means your website sucks. Or the page never existed and you suck. So neither is going to make anyone happy, really, in the end. And what do we do about it? It's really an easy solution. Who can tell me before I throw it up on the screen? Redirect them back to the homepage. You can redirect them to the homepage, right? What else? Where they were last. Where they were last. And that's really the answer, right? You, you move them somewhere else, or you send them somewhere else for now and hope that they like that better than what they found. So this is actually such a big problem on the internet that Google recommends that you do this for 180 days of creating a situation where you need a redirect. 180 days is half a year. That's kind of a long time to be maintaining things about old applications that you may be changing frequently. Maybe not frequently, but it's still something that you have to be conscious about and take actual action to fix. So before you kill Kenny, think about when you change your URLs. There are a couple options for dealing with this. The most probably well-known solution is Apache Mod Rewrite. Uh, if you're in Java land, you can use the Tucky URL Rewrite filter, or my own personal favorite, because I created it, the OCP Soft Rewrite URL Rewrite filter. And there are other solutions, like if you're in uh, .NET, you can use the IIS Rewrite extension, um, or what else? There's a whole bunch of things. You've got like tons of options for this. Um, but let's get to our next point, URL readability. I can't speak. So this is the problem with URL readability on the web. The Kindle. Can anyone tell me why this is the problem? Why? 
there's no URL. Like, okay. That's not the answer I'm looking for. The reason is because that is where you have to go to buy a Kindle. That's why I don't have one. What's that? That's why I don't have one. That's why you don't have one. Right. So there's only three reasons why I would ever click this. The first one is because I can tell it came from Amazon, and I already know about Amazon, which is pretty OK. I can, I can take that for granted. The second one is because I use Linux, and I don't fear viruses. <laughs> and the third is because maybe we're friends, and I might trust you enough to click a link that looks like complete garbage. This is what it should have been. How hard is this? It's not hard. But if we take a closer look at this address, which is kind of hard to read on the screen, I'm sorry, the Kindle Wi-Fi Touch display uh, with ink and all that stuff that's great about the Kindle, pay me Amazon, is right there in the front where it should be. But it's followed by all this junk. As it turns out, they are using an IBM product sales platform, which is what all this other garbage comes from. But really, it's not necessary, and it could, if not be hidden, at least kind of shoot off into the corner a little bit so that we don't have to worry about it as humans. Right? This is all stuff that Amazon uses to do their uh, referral tracking and you know, other statistics gathering and all that kind of stuff. But why do we need to see that? I mean, this is all optional for the URL. You can chop that off, and you'll still go to the, the Kindle. So why do we care? Why do we see that? Well, obviously, they can't get rid of it because they need to do their tracking, make sure that when you get referred from a website, they know what website you referred them to. You know, People can actually intercept these URLs, and they've been known to sort of gather up. They, they collect websites that post Amazon links for deals. And what they'll do is they'll, they'll gather up all these, these links from people's website, and they'll post it on their website, except they'll change the tracking token so that they get the credit for finding the deal and referring the person, which, OK. But if you're advertising that this came from another site, well, whatever. Anyway, we can kind of fix this. Why not compress this token, all these parameters, into something that is very clearly not meant for us, right? There's no text. There's no English. There's no language that we can understand in this token at the bottom. But all of the information is still there for Amazon to consume. And we get our nice little pretty guide at the top. This is actually really not hard to do. It just takes a little forethought. So that gets me to the next point, which is formatting this information. Is this really? Understandable? What is this doing? What happens when you go to this link? Buy shoes. Buy shoes. Right. But it would be a lot cooler if <laughs> we could put a little bit of logic into this. So example.com, great. We know where we're going. Now we're going to the store. Now we're buying shoes. And now we're buying the shoe with the product ID 1, which could have also been optimized out or left as a parameter, but that's up to all of us. And then this weird buy parameter. I don't know who would put a buy parameter in a URL. I was probably, you know. <laughs> so my next question is, what are you most afraid of when you buy a used car? A lemon. What you, can't see. what you can't see. Exactly. You're afraid that it might turn out to be this <laughs> in a few years <laughs> or a few months. That, yeah, that is a classic pile of junk. <laughs> so do you trust me? The answer I heard so far is no. Would you click this link at work? It's blocked. <laughs> <laughs> it's blocked. So why, why, do they, why do they block it? 
they don't trust they don't trust their employees trust me. and um, they perceive it as non-work. So they don't trust their employees, they perceive it as non-work, and I would argue that it's also a potential sexual harassment lawsuit waiting to happen. Yeah. <laughs> so let's see what happens. Sorry about that. <laughs> 70 million people have been Rickrolled. That's a really nice statistic. On that particular version. On this particular version. So 70 million people came to this link. That's designed for that. <laughs> which was designed for the explicit purpose of tricking you into going somewhere where you're going to have to see Rick Astley do that dance. Because we can't see what's in here. So we can actually build trust for all of our users and for all of our internet friends if we had just done something like this and put the name of the video in the URL. Now we wouldn't be able to participate in fun internet memes. Our loss. But actually, YouTube. What? Yes. That would be problematic. So, right, the comment was you'd have to start tracking uh, unique video names and you'd run out of names. But wouldn't it spur a lot of school children to learn Bulgarian in order to open up a lot of new names? <laughs> you would potentially have to learn some languages. Uh, so yeah, the other comment was you're actually doing my presentation for me. This is great. You can actually solve this problem by Putting, prefixing the title of the URL with the username, and now you have an infinite namespace because everyone can duplicate whatever video name they want, and as long as it's under their username, then there's no conflict with other people because we don't care about people conflicting with themselves because that would just be silly. So that brings us to revealing sensitive information, the part where you see things that maybe you shouldn't, like Nobody likes to admit they use .NET. Not even Microsoft, as it turns out. Because when I go to their fact.aspx page, they redirect me away from that. And I no longer, no longer see their lovely, crappy technology. So that's a little embarrassing. Um, we have all these frameworks, right? We have Java web frameworks. We have more Java web frameworks, and PHP web frameworks, and more Java web frameworks, and Ruby web frameworks, and Perl web frameworks, or C, or whatever technology you want to put under it, and more Java web frameworks, and Microsoft web frameworks, and Java web frameworks, <laughs> of which there aren't that many, but yes, there are, and whatever else you want to use. So when you're building your application, what do you, how do you pick between all these? What was that? Whatever fits your needs and what you know. Which could be dependent on who is working for you at that given time, which could potentially change over time. Meaning, if you want to move to a new framework and migrate an old application, you now have to change all of your URLs, which is getting back to our first problem. You've just created a situation where you have to redirect people. And this situation is difficult. You have thousands of pages. Maybe you have hundreds of pages or tens of pages with dynamic information, dynamic links that take parameters and accept input and send people to something that has meaning in the application. Well, we could have prevented this if we had simply done a little URL rewriting to start with. If we had taken the forethought to remove the technology-specific suffix from our page, whether that be HTML, Perl, PHP, Ruby, C, whatever. We could have eliminated this problem, and, or at least simplified the problem, and given us the opportunity to not have to redirect people and not have to worry about sending them to the wrong place and 404-ing them and showing them that pretty little kitten. 
So it comes down to a good magician never reveals their secrets, or their implementation in this case. Right? Why would we show them how we do what we do? That's giving them information that they could use to potentially exploit us. I think Apache has been contributing to this for a good long time because every Apache server comes by default configured to say, hey, I'm Apache, and here's my version and my build number. So if you know a particular exploit of that particular version and build of Apache, you can then get very specific information about how to bypass its security features or use it to you know, get access to the system or whatever you want to do. So I would suggest if you are building an implementation of a website that needs to be secure and manages client-sensitive data, you probably want to get rid of anything that has to do with your hardware, whatever infrastructure you're using. Just get rid of it. Why reveal that information? Make them guess first. Security through obscurity is not the best practice, but it is a pretty good starting point. Because if you don't know, then you have to figure out. And figuring out can be very difficult. So this brings us to the last of our uh, problems with the internet. Are there only five problems with the internet? <laughs> if you have to expose data, you have to remember, uh, expose data in the URL, you have to remember that URLs and headers and cookies are user input too, right? It's not just the forms and the buttons and, and all that lovely stuff that shows up that people can click and type in. It's the address bar. It's the stuff that the browser sends and the stuff that your server receives kind of transparently that we all kind of forget about. And those are all things that are vulnerable. Uh, an interesting study was done by Aspect Security. And they, uh, they did a big poll of the, the open source security vulnerability database. And they found that two of the three most recent vulnerabilities found in popular web frameworks, which happen to be Java, uh, because those are basically the enterprise-y things that people tend to gravitate to, were actually based in the URL. And this is interesting because a lot of frameworks, and I'm sure Java is not the only one, actually use some scripting-like languages in various places so that you can more quickly accomplish complex tasks. It just so happens that both of the frameworks that were affected by this allowed you to script things in the URL. And not only could you script things in the URL, you could invoke any typed, any statically typed object in the URL. So if you could access it statically, you could execute it. Like in the Java virtual machine, you have this system object. The system object has something called system.exit. Now system.exit isn't the worst thing because shutting down the application kind of closes a bunch of security holes with it. But System.eval is a little more worrisome <laughs> because now you're executing code as the user that that Java virtual machine is running in, the entire JVM. So if that's not secured, then you have, you know, if, if they're not running in a root, even if they are, you can break out of it. You know, you can, you've got access to the file system at that point. You can write to that user's directory. You can start executing code, and then you can start executing things and attacking things from inside the system itself, and that's just a really bad situation. Right? And this was the other one. So the first one was Spring, MBC, I think. And this, this is the Seam. Uh, the first one was Seam, and this one was uh, Struts, sorry, Struts 2, uh, which is a very popular Java web framework. And then Spring, which is also a very popular Java web framework. So we can actually secure this using URL rewriting. Using um, mod rewrite, you could do this. You could do this using a native Java uh, URL rewriting technology, which is what I'm showing you here. I'm saying when the direction of the request is inbound, or when the direction of the, uh, the rewriting event is inbound, so you're getting a request, we're going to check the URL, and we're going to check all of the header names and values for bad things. And then if bad things exist, we're going to send them to the 404 page or potentially take whatever action we want. You know, we could potentially 
aggregate the number of times that we get bad things from a particular IP address or from a range of IP addresses, and we could send them to, say, a honeypot, where we've pretty much determined that they're trying to do bad things to us because they've hit our bad things filter a number of times, and we can start treating them like they have asked to be treated. So that's one approach. And this is our bad things filter. Who can tell me what's wrong with this? Why is this bad things filter not good enough? Right. Right. So the first response was, it's only looking for a few special things. The second response was, don't forget Unicode. One of the lovely things about regular expressions is that they accept Unicode. And actually, any string matching will you know, have to watch out for Unicode, which is a. Matching anything at the beginning and end, so. Right. But actually, that's, this is matching anything at the beginning and end, but basically we're saying that if there's any bad character anywhere, found anywhere, it will be a, it, it'll catch it. But the problem is, as we you know, said, you're, we're only looking for a few small things. It's not a, a whitelist, it's a blacklist. Blacklists are ultimately fallible, right? There are always ways around a blacklist. So the better approach would be to say, our URL only accepts alphanumeric characters. And in that case, then you would have a pretty restricted set of URLs and headers, but it would be much less likely that someone's going to be able to get around this, this attack uh, filter. So this is a real life URL. And if you can tell me where this goes, and you haven't seen my talk before, <laughs> I'll give you $10. You can type it in. You have 30 seconds. All right, no one's even trying. That's, that's fair. So what this should have been is the kids' department. That's an excellent expression. <laughs> why? I, I don't understand why this, oh, sorry. Why this couldn't just be slash kids. To be fair, I think L.L. Bean has seen my talk a few times. They've actually changed it a little bit. It's now maybe like a third as long as that top one, but there's still a bunch of junk in there. And unfortunately, <laughs> when you access this URL, it does work but it sends you to the other one. <laughs> I don't get it. But let's take another look at this. And this is just going to be beating that dead horse, right? So we're at LL Bean. We're in a web app. Thanks. I think I knew that already. <laughs> now we're using another IBM product management suite, product sales suite. And we're running in a servlet. So now we have Java. And everyone knows that we're using Java. And now we're in category 28. Awesome. I love category 28. It's my favorite. I'm going to have some 28s someday. Um, and <laughs> we're in store ID 1. I didn't know there was more than one LL Bean. I guess they have a bunch of stores, but their web store could potentially be like store number 1 or something like that. Or we could iterate through categories and see if there are hidden categories. All right. We could start. Trying to find, trying to iterate through categories to see what else we can find, right? We can start playing with this. Trying to find the free products, free products exactly. Uh, catalog ID one, you know, we're starting to get the point. Language ID negative one. I don't know who speaks that. <laughs> Computers don't even speak negative one, not really. And then this thing, I don't know what that is. So the moral of the story is clean and validate because that's giving us a lot of places where we can start immediately attacking this address. We are being literally told, this is everywhere I accept input. So let's be a little smarter about this. So I'd just like to take a short moment to 
let everyone sort of relax, chill out, take a look at the HTTP specification from the W3C. Status code 14 is I'm a teapot. The resulting entity may be short and stout. I don't know. It's there. <laughs> you can use it. OK. So in summary, we've got a few problems. And we're very good at introducing more of these problems every day we d design a lazy application. Uh, we've got missing or relocated resources. We have a problem with readability and clutter, like our friends over at Amazon. Uh, we then have a problem where we need to format and keep this information you know, viable for both humans and computers. There's a whole gap there. And then we have the problem of revealing sensitive information, deciding what we want people to actually be able to see and put input into, and then validating that so that we can potentially secure the attack vectors. So URL rewriting can help with this, right? We can filter inbound URLs. We can filter headers. We can modify the response to remove sensitive information on the way out. We can do all that kind of stuff. And there are two primary types of URL rewriting tools. The first are proxy-based, where you're running some other server in front of your application. The most common of these is uh, Apache Mod Rewrite. I actually went to a talk on uh, Varnish yesterday, which was interesting, because that's another proxy-based tool that is doing its own form of URL rewriting. It can actually modify the header. It can modify the request going in and out of the server, all that good stuff. And it also provides a nice little caching mechanism, which is really actually, it would look pretty sweet, but that's an aside. So the others are filter-based or application-based solutions. And these are the solutions that actually run in the application that you are doing the URL rewriting for. They are things that, well, we'll talk about what you should and shouldn't do in each one in just a second. There are basic things that we can do with all types, though. And these are things like redirection and relocation, right? So we can say, we want to go somewhere else. We, we hit a URL, and we want to send the user to somewhere else. That's a redirection. And that's pretty common knowledge, I would say. The next thing we can do, which is also pretty common, is inbound parameterization. So we have an address for an application that has a bunch of query parameters on the end. We can actually move those query parameters into the path of the URL so that they're structured. We read from left to right, generally, as an English-speaking society. So we can put this information in a left to right order for our users. The query parameters are, by specification, unordered. They can arrive in any direction, any order. So we can help address the usability problem by ordering things and putting them in the path, if they're applicable. We can do URL validation, where we cleanse the URL, as I showed you with the bad things filter. We can start sanitizing things and monitoring what's going on which is a little harder to do with mod rewrite just because you know it's all, you're shaking your head. Oh, OK. I'm right. OK, good. <laughs> I thought I missed something for a second. Yeah, I mean, uh, mod rewrite is pretty much a lot of regular expressions. And I think without plugins, it would be pretty hard to set up a blacklist or a whitelist to be effective and still let your application function. It could be done, I'm sure, but it'd be probably hard. Then you have like header modification and, and validation of the headers, like I mentioned, also in the bad things example. So I would just like to say I have no personal investment in any of these tools. As you know, that is a lie. But I wouldn't be giving this talk if I didn't have some kind of investment. So please forgive me for any personal bias. Um, there are some cool things that we can do with Java-based tools or application-based tools. In this case, I'm going to be showing you Java because that's what I work with. Again, I, please, I apologize. Uh, I think Java is really cool. I happen to be probably one of the, the few people who does, but I like it. <laughs> you can do a lot of really neat stuff with Java. Um, so you can do things like transformation and canonicalization. This is another application of a, a, a basic URL rewriting strategy, which is just changing the address and, sending, and redirecting them somewhere. But in this case, we can actually do something cool. We can say, when the inbound path 
matches something.css, we can actually do a forward, which is an internal redirect, so the client browser is never updated. And we can forward it to a different resource, like, say, less. How many people here are familiar with less or SAS? It's basically a <coughs> templating language for CSS. It's a, a higher level construct for building CSS <coughs> so that you don't have to repeat things like your color definition, right? How many times do you have to put pound F A 2 B 3 D into your style sheet and remember which color means what, right? You can define variables, you can assign things to them. It basically turns CSS into a programming, progr programming language which is useful. So we can forward them to that less resource and then have our server sort of dynamically compile and cache that thing so that it gets sent out of CSS. Now we don't have to worry about an extra build step in our application. We don't have to compile the style sheets. We just deploy it. The request comes in for a CSS file. The application says, hey, I know what that is. I'm going to compile that for you, cache it, and serve it up. So that's one option, right? The other is, Let's say we know that everything coming in as an address needs to be lowercased. Well, we can take an inbound request, say, if there are any uppercase characters, we can just drop them down, do a redirect, and make sure the person got what they still wanted to go to. You could argue that this is sort of adding multiple inputs or multiple entry points to the application, because now you have more than one place where you can actually access information. But because you're going to be doing a, a redirect, you can basically say, no, we still have this one entry point. This is what you meant. Fix your links. So then we have complex conversion and validation. And this gets to things where you probably really wouldn't associate them with a URL rewriting tool in the traditional sense. This is very application specific. This is something where you're now basically introducing an aspect. It's a little bit like aspect-oriented programming. So you have this functionality in an application, and you have a couple ways where you know information is going to be coming from the URL into the application. So for the instance where you have a store here, we can say, if we have a product with a product ID, where the product ID matches some you know, allowed value, then we can bind that to a property in the application. So a product bean. Beans are these lovely little storage containers in Java, and they taste good. Then we can convert that text product ID with the converter, which could do, say, like a database lookup, and try to find a product that exists. We can then validate the data that comes out. Actually, I think these two are, are switched. We probably want to validate before we convert. But, um, now we have a project object that's getting injected into the application, and we don't have to do that lookup in the actual business logic code. We've, we've sort of extracted it out. Now it's in this higher level that applies to, say, a number of pages. You could you know, use this same rule and add a few more paths that would match to it. And you just have this ability to reduce the potential amount of code that you'd have to do on each page. That's just a very application-specific strategy. And I don't recommend or not recommend doing this. It's just something you can do when you have URL rewriting in the application itself. An interesting thing that I stumbled uh, upon, an interesting usability uh, case. How many of you guys and girls have used um, like a single sign-on from Google for some third-party product? where you go to that website and it says, hey, log in with Google. You've seen it, OK. And you guys, have, you've used it. You've, you've implemented it. <laughs> so open ID and such. Open ID, exactly. Open ID, uh, OAuth, that kind of stuff. So you get this, Facebook. yeah, Facebook, who created their own specification, lovely. Um, you get the situation where you have a user who has gone to a third-party website, and you have access to their email address. That's all that they give you permission for. Uh, and maybe their name, their, their like, human name, not their handle or their call sign or whatever. 
So we actually want their handler their call sign because we want them to have the ability to be anonymous. We need to be able to call them something. So what happens is we, they come to our website and we say, log in with Google. They click log in with Google, they go to Google, they type their credentials. Google sends them back with the authentication uh, tokens to our website, which handles it and says, okay, now we have their name and their email address. So we're partially authenticated. Uh, or we, we have a successful authentication, but we still don't know who they are. We want another call sign. So what do we do? Well, they can't really start posting things on our website yet. They can't really start accessing things yet because we don't know what to show on the website when they post something. Because we don't want to show their name or their email address. We want to show their call sign. So we can intercept this situation and say, we got a response back. They're technically logged in, but they don't have a confirmed username. So intercept any of these situations on any of our pages and send them to the account confirmation page where they're going to have to say, where we say to them, hey, what's your call sign? Before you continue, you need to do this. They type in their call sign, they hit enter, and then they go back to where they were intending to go. That's request interception, which is something that is very difficult to do in a proxy-based solution because you don't know application-specific information about that uh, that use case. So that's one of the cool things you can do with application-specific uh, URL rewriting tools. So, so there are some things that you should not do <coughs> with an application-based URL rewriting tool. Who here knows what those are? Guesses? <laughs> should never use one at all. That's not the answer I was looking for. <laughs> But it is an answer, thank you. So if you're doing something like notifying your users of downtime or telling them that your site will be back up in two hours when it's down, you probably don't want the code that's going to be showing them when the application is down and that they should come back in two hours in the actual application because it's going to be down. So that's when you would use a proxy-based solution to show them a page other than your website. Because if you put that in the website, it's not going to be there because the website is down. Because you put the logic in the website, and now the website, yeah. <laughs> so <clears throat> that's one of the things you shouldn't do. If, if, it needs, if, if the code needs to run while the application is not, the code should not be in the application. <laughs> so yeah, there it is again. <laughs> so the bonus round. Um, there's this big shift toward client-side applications. And things like JavaScript. Everyone loves JavaScript these days. And we're all using it um, to build highly reactive, highly responsive, pretty flashy applications that do lots of stuff. I remember the day when you could, or most people actually disabled JavaScript in the browser because you got all these little pop-ups saying, JavaScript failure, JavaScript failure because of Internet Explorer. So those days are over, and unfortunately, uh, JavaScript is here to stay at this point. Only the dialog boxes have disappeared. Only the dialog boxes have disappeared. <laughs> there are still lots of failures. That's right. So we have this interesting situation. Um, so can't I just ignore the URL now because everything's running in the client, and we don't really care about where they are or where this thing is running? Well, the answer is sort of, right? So take Twitter, for example. There was a good long time when Twitter used a uh, shebang or a pound sign and an exclamation point in the address to be, so that their client application could you know, send people to new usernames, new profiles without doing a redirect in order to make things more responsive and quicker and snappier. So we would have twitter.com slash Lincoln3, that's me, and then that, would, that request would go into the server, which would serve up Lincoln 3, and then the client would change it to something like connect or discover if you wanted to see different views of your profile or other people's profiles and that kind of stuff. So you'd never actually have to send a new browser URL request to the server. It would be doing that in the background. And they did that with the uh, anchor tag, which is something uh, the anchor tag content actually never goes to the server. 
That's something that some people sometimes forget. Um, even if it's an initial request, that anchor never, never makes it to the server. It just doesn't go through. The browser never sends it. So we, Twitter decided they wanted to clean it up. And we don't see that pound sign exclamation point in the URL anymore. So they used what we call HTML5 push state, which lets you modify the browser URL in the browser without actually sending another request to the server, uh, which is why Sometimes you might think maybe you can just forget about URLs now. But we have this inter interesting situation. We can have a request to the server, and then the application is served from the root, or maybe it's served from login or login uh, link, yeah, or link in my project. So we have all these different contexts where the application can be served from. We have these bookmarkable addresses. You can bookmark any of those things. And when that request goes to the server, the server says, OK, here's your client code application. Those little gears get served up. It starts running in the browser. The client application inspects the URL and says, OK, I know where I am. I know what I need to show. And this is pretty straightforward until we get something like this. We get example.com slash Lincoln uh, and then project one. This is a discernible URL. The application knows where it is. But now we have this, a project called Lincoln. Now there's a question. Where was the client application actually served from? What's the root? Um, actually, before I show this, there's a really easy way to solve this problem, which is to hard code your application root into the client application, which, if you're hosting on a single website for yourself or for a customer, is fine. You can just hard code it. But what if you're delivering a product that people are going to be hosting on their own infrastructure under their own paths? Now you have a situation where potentially this could occur. It's, it's variable. So you can't hard code it, but you could send a response containing a cookie with the path to where the application was deployed containing the correct location. And if the browser doesn't support cookies, you could have the client application send an, an HTTP head request to ask, hey, where am I? Where, should I? where should I be displaying things from? And then you respond with the, the, the correct information in, in another header or even in the content of the response. So right, you could just hard code it if you have that luxury. Um, I think I missed a slide here. Oh, OK, yeah, all right, we're good. Yeah, so what just happened? We did a bunch of things with URL rewriting. We talked about a bunch of things. So how do we use that in practice? But before I do the demos, do you guys have any questions on what I've said so far? Isn't it kind of crazy to do validation in the same step as URL rewriting because you'd really like to validate all paths to the, the service, and the ugliest path is the place where the rubber really hits the road there. Um, couldn't you have a less leaky boat by perhaps you use the same tool, but in a separate pass, validating the ugliest parts and rewriting to beautify the, uh, to uglify the, the pretty stuff as it comes in and, and then beautify mm -hmm. it on the way out. Right, so the question was, shouldn't you do your validation and your prettification in different steps because it'll be clearer and more secure and all that stuff? Is that a good summary? Yeah. Okay. So my response to that is absolutely. You definitely should do them in different places. And actually, I think the first demo is going to show that. So I, I wanted to let you guys actually use this to v view these demos live on the cloud, but OpenShift has been doing some maintenance, and these demos are down at the moment. But yeah, I, I had a particular problem. I, I had a personal problem with their migration. I, I did something custom for this app, and it, it went down. Um, but the other one's actually up, and I can show that. So I want to go to the local access demo. And I'm going to get out of full screen so you can see the address bar. So this is an example of doing access control with a URL rewriting framework. Uh, so I have a time-based access control where we have the page refreshing every second and the 
application is deciding that you can only access this within the first 30 seconds of the minute. The second 30 seconds of the minute, the application is inaccessible. Again, like I said before, usually when you're showing downtime or things where, or, or times when the application is not going to be, be available, you want to do that in a proxy-based solution. But this is just an example showing that you can do this. The next is uh, domain-based access control. So we can have a single application that is determining where the request is coming from, uh, intended to be going to. So if we change the domain of our URL, we can control who gets to see that. So when I access this from localhost, we have the page, we have access. But when I access it from, oops, no. From localhost, we don't have access. And this is something that is more common because a lot of times you want to have, say, a custom domain for each client or uh, different subdomains of the same product. Like Stack Overflow has all these different uh, instances of Stack Overflow with different, different domains. Uh, they probably. They, they may actually have separate server farms for each one, but it could be likely that they have one server farm and one application running for all of these different things. So let's just quickly see how we did that. We have our access rewrite configuration where we're doing some prettification. We're joining a path to an internal resource, and then we are doing our timer work down here. So if the request is inbound and, uh, yeah, this is not important, and we're viewing the timer page, then we check to see if the time has or has not been granted. If it has been granted, then we um, just say, OK, we're done. That's cool. Show the page. And <clears throat> Otherwise, where's the otherwise? Uh, yeah, OK, so other, we have a catch all condition down here saying if nothing else handled this inbound request, then we're going to show the access denied page. Um, so that's just a very simple example. The next thing that I wanted to show you is bad things, right? So let's go back to the root of this demo. We have this welcome page here. What happens if I try to start hacking? Right, I start posting things with query parameters, and now I start getting ugly. I've detected bad things coming in, and I've been able to handle this and respond to it appropriately. This, as you suggested, has been done in a separate configuration with a simple rule with our bad things. Any questions about this? The next thing I'd like to show, which is one of my personal favorites, is the Amazon example. So taking all of that lovely Amazon information and turning it into something that we know we don't care about. OK, so they've cleaned up a little bit. I'll just do an example. So we go to our composite query parameter demo. And this demo is basically going to say, anything that we get as a query parameter is going to be encoded and compressed into one parameter that our users will not be able to read. So what should my query parameter say? What would you like me to put in here? First thing that comes off the top of your head. App name, location. App name equals location. What else? Admin, Admin equals one. OK. And Lincoln Not that anybody here is cool. <laughs> Not that anyone here is an admin. All right, so I'm going to 
submit this, uh, I'm going to send a GET request to my server, and the server is going to respond with a redirect. And that redirect sent me to a nice, long, ugly thing. <laughs> but it's very clear that I, as a person, am not meant to understand this. So we have a verification down here at the bottom in the page saying, OK, well, we know we have our admin parameter. Lincoln is still cool. And then our app name location. So we have all of the information. The computer can still comprehend this, but we don't. The other interesting application of this is when you're doing encryption or encoding, you can start to really tell when people are messing with you. So if I just change one thing here, I'm going to add a 7 and submit that. We know that our query string has been modified. We're no longer in a secure situation, and we can start dealing with it again. And I know a lot of companies use web services and all that kind of stuff to uh, transfer data back and forth. And if they're, if they're actually not able to transfer the user session because they're going between technologies, they'll end up sending these URLs with a bunch of information in them to get the person over to the other application. So if you ever need to send someone to another application and you're sending them there with a redirect, please encrypt and encode that redirect. You can, you can accept this parameter, this big, long, ugly query string, and then just immediately redirect away from it and hide it. But make sure you do that step, because otherwise you're sending plain text and you can start exposing bad things. It's, it's not hidden, but it's... Still be in everybody's privacy law. Right. But if it's encrypted, then in theory, you should have a more secure situation. So the, his, his uh, statement was, it would still be in all the proxy logs. Yes, it's still out there. It's still potentially vulnerable. But it is less vulnerable. And security is all about making things less vulnerable, because there is no invulnerable. So um, those are just the two demos I wanted to show you guys. And to sum up, we've got problems, right? We have missing and relocated resources. We have things that are no longer there or were never there that just constantly pop up and give us grief. We have this readability and clutter problem. And we have the situation where we need to format this information so that humans can understand it and c computers can comprehend it, but they don't get confused with each other then taking that information and making sure that while we can still comprehend it, we are not just blindly accepting it. Because the U URL, headers, anything that comes in from the client is an attack vector. So validate it. And there are many other problems that we didn't talk about today, but these are a small subset that I find particularly interesting. <coughs> so URL rewriting is not a good choice for doing it wrong please consider making your applications more secure and more humanly readable and not like YouTube. So is this the end? Hopefully it's the beginning of your adventure with URL rewriting. <laughs> I'm sure many of you are already on your journey. So thank you for coming. And please, if you're interested in anything that I spoke about today, visit my website, check out OCP Soft Rewrite, which is my personal creation. and. Uh, let me know what you think. Questions? Sir, um, can you point to any research on <coughs> changes in usability for normal human being users who don't pay attention to URLs anyways? Um, I don't have any research for that. Uh, I would say that if your u users don't look at the URL anyways, then it doesn't matter. Right. So the question was, does it really matter if you have a pretty URL if your users don't care? And the answer is no, it probably doesn't. But you still need to be concerned about the security aspect. And that gets back to our lovely, well, I'm not going to go all the way back there, the Kindle problem, right? You've got 
all the stuff that's exposed and you can cl clean it up. Uh, so the good, the good argument there is if they don't care, they will care about security. Right, they will care about security. So, uh, any other questions? Thanks for coming. Most enterprises today realize that usernames and passwords alone aren't enough to keep their network safe from unauthorized intrusions. That's why two-factor authentication has gotten so popular lately. It adds that extra layer of protection enterprise networks need to stay safe. But what you may not know is that some two-factor authentication solutions, they're better than others, like two-factor strong authentication with Wicked. Wicked goes beyond other authentication systems by being less expensive easier to implement, and easier to use, giving you software-based token clients built to run on all major devices and OSs, including iOS and Android. These tokens utilize a public-private key combination that's generated on device, so there aren't any shared secrets flying around for attackers to hijack, or which require any special handling. Instead, all keys are kept secure and private between the requesting token and your server, which you control in-house making it the most secure way possible to perform authentication encryption. And with an extensive, flexible API and support for protocols like LDAP and RADIUS, Wicked works with any enterprise network architecture to protect the IT systems vital to your enterprise. Download your Wicked free trial today. Regardless of whether you're considering two-factor authentication for the first time or just ready to ditch your existing expensive key fob system, we can help with easy to implement, easy to use, strong authentication. From Wicked. Cloud stacks are everywhere. This is the way to, to better utilize uh, all your resources and it makes managing all your resources pretty easy. All of the innovation is happening in open source. The, the collaborative nature and of the uh, you know of the community and, and the speed at which these uh, these you know these these deficiencies these bugs are getting discovered and then fixed is a, a thing that really shows the power of the you know of the open source community. It is global and it's definitely because of the users. Community people are extremely friendly and uh, always ready to help. If you go on to IRC any day, you'll see these guys helping each other out, and they're all doing it like in a selfless manner. The product is transparent for everyone. Everyone can look at the code base. Um, everyone can see how CloudStack is, is being built. Nothing, nothing is proprietary. Everything is open. In many ways, it's absolutely vital to the, to the ongoing health of CloudStack. The most exciting event uh, in recent memory for me uh, was our first developer boot camp. Uh, and you know, our call gave people, I think, maybe two weeks notice to come attend. I was expecting 25 or, or 30 people. Uh, so we ended up with uh, 87 <laughs> people uh, and had to go get more chairs uh, into the room twice. Everything within cloud computing is commodity and is open source. And so I, I don't think that you will, uh, you, you'll see anywhere where open source is not pervasive in cloud computing. And so I, I, think it's, uh, I think it's an assumption. I think when you talk about cloud computing, you're really talking about open source cloud computing. CloudStack is a robust solution for large deployments. You have dozens of data centers and thousands of servers in each data center. Is, uh, these um, uh, hardware is going to fail, and CloudStack is designed to handle number one that mass scale. Number two, it's designed to handle the failure that inevitably happens. Uh, 
in large deployments. We started working on CloudStack over four years ago, uh, and you know it was the original set of people working on it uh, had a background of delivering software to telcos and service providers. Lots of QA, lots of users actually using it. High availability is the key feature. Uh, multiple hypervisor support, uh, different network models, you can pick up whatever suits you better. Cloudstack management server can be deployed in different physical machines. It definitely has a huge footprint, it's being deployed everywhere. There's a major movie studio that uh, um, they were using Cloudstack, they were using it to transcode video, and I thought that was terribly fascinating. What I found more fascinating is what they did during lunch, where they would spin up uh, you know, 50 or 60 game servers, and then as soon as lunch was over, they would destroy all the instances and go back to doing real work. CloudStack is vast. Uh, it touches so many different aspects, and there's no one person that's kind of like a master of all those realms. I think CloudStack as a project is going to be uh, one of the leaders simply because it's some of the most featureful and and, uh, and robust platforms out there. I don't see any limits to the cloud stack. When we created Asterisk over a decade ago, we could not have imagined that Asterisk would not only become the most widely adopted open source communication software on the planet, but that it would impact the entire industry in the way that it has. Today, Asterisk has found its way into more than 170 countries and virtually every Fortune 1000 company. The success of Asterisk has enabled a transition of power from the hands of the traditional proprietary phone vendors into the hands of the users and administrators of phone systems. Using this power, our customers have created all sorts of business-changing applications, from small office phone systems to mission-critical call centers to international carrier networks. In fact, there's even an entire country whose communications infrastructure runs on Asterisk. Digium has always been about creating technology that expands communications capabilities in ways that we could never have imagined. And that's part of what's game-changing about Digium. Today, we're doing it again, this time by introducing a new family of HDIP phones that extends control of the user all the way to the desktop. The launch of these new products represents the next phase in Digium's history of innovation. These are the first and only IP phones designed to fully leverage the power of Asterisk. When we first discussed our expectations for building a family of phones for use with Asterisk, our requirements were pretty simple. We asked the team to build the phones such that they were easy to install, integrate, provision, and use. I think you'll soon agree our engineers have delivered on that goal. User feedback is validating that when it comes to operation with Asterisk based systems, including our own SwitchFox based product, these are the easiest to use, best integrated, most interoperable products on the market today. The Digium family of phones will initially include three IP desk phones, uniquely designed to complement any Asterisk or SwitchFox based solution. These phones are different for a number of reasons. First, they're exclusively designed for use with Asterisk. Secondly, we've made it really easy to auto-discover and provision the phones. Next, we've made it easy for the phones to access information inside of Asterisk, allowing tight coupling between an application and the phone. Additionally, we've created an applications engine that allows users and developers to create and run their own apps on the phone. And finally, we've done all of this at a very compelling price point. At Digium, we're always thinking of ways to give our customers the best value in business phone systems and also give them the power to create their own solutions for any communications challenge. We'll continue to push the boundaries, not only to make Asterisk cooler and faster and more technologically feature rich, but to make Asterisk and VoIP communications even easier. And together, we'll change the way the world communicates. Again. Your customers rely on your website or application. If it's slow or non-responsive, it infuriates your users and costs you money. Keeping your business-critical systems humming along requires insight into what they're doing.
Your system metrics tell stories, stories that can reveal performance bottlenecks, resource limitations, and other problems. But how do you keep an eye on all of your system's performance metrics in real time and record this data for later analysis? Enter Longview, the new way to see what's really going on under the hood. The Longview dashboard lets you visualize the status of all your systems, providing you with a bird's eye view of your entire fleet. You can sort by CPU, memory, swap, processes load, and network usage. Click a specific system to access its individual dashboard, then click and drag to zoom in on choke points and get more detail. Comprehensive network data, including inbound and outbound traffic, is available on the Network tab, and Disk Writes and Free Space on the Disks tab, while the Process Explorer displays usage statistics for individual processes. The System Info tab shows listening services, active connections, and available updates. Adding Longview to a system is easy. Just click the button, copy the one-line installation command, then run the command on your Linux system to complete the process. The agent will begin collecting data and sending it to Longview. Then the graphs start rolling. Use Longview to gain visibility into your servers, so when your website or app heats up, it stays up.